Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying around for the whole day. Sad time has come. It's our final speech of the day. But we've got a good one for you, a really good one. So our last speaker for the night is Robert Powell. The uh, title of his talk is You Are Being Manipulated. He's the senior, senior software, well, I've been talking way too much today, the senior software engineer at Cisco. Although he does have a degree in psychology, which is interesting, he spent the last 18 years in InfoSec, or we like to call it here, cyber. Just kidding, don't call it cyber. I was, I was going to actually tell all the, the new DEF CON people to walk around saying cyber because it's cool, but I thought that was mean, so don't do it. Okay. Um, some other interesting things, uh, Robert likes long walks on the beach, he likes to make beer, and he likes martial arts. So I think we know a lot about you at this point. Okay, so join me in welcoming Robert. Okay, so uh, I will say thanks to everybody for staying. Um, you know, and I saw that they're... I said, I said Robert. <laughs> it's James. So to, to, be, to be fair, I figured it was safer just to go by Robert for the rest of the con and tell you guys that I had messed up that. Okay, let's start this over. <laughs> I'm introducing our last speaker tonight, James Powell. <laughs> on the topic, you are being manipulated. We can edit that or no, I'm hoping. No, we can't edit it? Okay, so for all posterity, this is the second and real introduction. Now, he does have a degree, all that other stuff was true. He does like make beer and martial arts and he has a degree in psychology and he is the senior software engineer at Cisco. All of that's true, but his name, his name is James. Okay, so now welcome me, help me welcome James Powell. <laughs> so again, because it's DEF CON, I will go by, you know, Robert, James, Gray Raven, just, you know, say, hey, you, and then if I don't turn around and say, no, no, hey, you. Um, so with that in mind, um, thank you once again for staying. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Um, I, realized, I didn't realize that there were going to be talks this late, but I am very happy because now I'm actually in my zone. This is where I do my best work. So. Some of you may be wondering why I chose a title, You Are Being Manipulated and not You May Be Manipulated. And it's the, because the more that I kind of dug into this topic, the more I realized it's happening all the time, it's happening all around us. Um, uh, this realization came through, um, if you read the abstract, my three, now three and a half year old daughter, she's actually going to be four in October, um, which you would think that's kind of weird. Why is this grown adult um, who has a degree in psychology talking about his daughter? Well, it's because children are amazing social engineers. So you guys got my introduction, so I'm going to skip over, actually let me start my, uh, my timer so I can keep track of that up here. All right. Um, you know, you guys may be wondering why I'm starting up here, you guys got my introduction. Uh, normally I would tell you guys a little bit more about myself, um, but if, as you can see from the screen, uh, there is a tiny child there, that's my daughter Lena. She is really the hero of this story, and she's the reason why I'm able to stand up here and tell you guys what I learned, uh, which hopefully will be good for all you guys when you leave here, especially given where we are. So, like I said, children are natural social engineers. It's because they're, they, you know, and I feel bad saying this because I love my daughter, she's a great kid, but children, especially small children, have a, um, how do we say it, a moral flexibility. Um, <laughs> they just have goals. They really don't have the society pressures of right and wrong, they just, you know, they see something, they want it, they do what they have to to get it. Um, anyone who does this for a living, uh, you, you can, you know what that's like. So, um, my, uh, my first thought when I saw this was basically to lose hope in humanity. You know, we, we, we go and we, we spend money to become better social engineers, we spend money to teach our companies to do this, and my daughter does all of this very naturally. At some point we forget how to do this, and that's, uh, that's probably a shame for us. Well, no, it may actually be while we have society around us. So, um, Half of the room, maybe not this room, uh, usually half, about half the room is wondering about the title and I haven't really explained that yet. So to be fair, you're always being manipulated. It's always happening. Most of it is benign, most of it is, is actually good. It's how we survive. But you know, there's that whole malicious element that we would like to deal with. And you know, we're really good at making secure systems. Well, I argue we're really good at making secure systems. I am a, a software engineer, so I have to. And, uh, but the humans, kind of come along and they do one thing and then we're all in a bad situation and we're all up on the weekends. So, like I said, most of the interactions are benign. But as I was watching my daughter and as she was doing these things to kind of get me 
into uh, to get her to do you know to get like extra pieces of candy or chocolate or whatever she wanted at the time a, free, a new toy or whatever. Um, I realized that instead I should be looking at these as opportunities to train myself. And to paraphrase an instructor of mine, uh, he said that you know essentially that every moment in life, good or bad, can be used as training if we look at it that way. So in an effort to embrace that wisdom, I said, all right, let's look and see what my daughter can teach me about social engineering. But before I get to actually the program that I ended up developing based on her, my interactions with her and her being my teacher instead of the other way around, uh, let's look at some of our actors in this situation. So the good guys, right? And I say good guys with a question mark because the very first example I'm going to give you guys is corporations. Um, advertising more specifically. And I know we all love advertisers, especially when we're online and we've got our ad blockers on and then they tell us that we can't view the article we want to read because we've got an ad blocker. We love that. So advertising is an amazing study, especially for someone who's actually you know, an armchair psychologist like myself, in how to manipulate people. Their goal is to design a message and then get you to do something. I mean, it's classic social engineering. Um, and then next we have friends and family. And as you can tell from the picture, my daughter has won that day. I am just drained. I have you know, no expression. She's pointing to tell me to go this way and pretty much I followed around wherever she wanted me to go the rest of the night where she sat comfortably on my shoulders getting carried around I think the botanical gardens in Atlanta. And then finally we have pets. Now think about it. Pets kind of may seem like a weird one but we bring them into our homes, these strange little furry animals, and we feed them, we take care of them, we pet them, we love them, and at least in the example of cats, they might love us back. I mean, I like to think the cats love us back, but you know, I'm, I'm a cat person, so we'll, you know, we'll go on with that. And you know, I will point out that for any kind of information security talk, this does satisfy the requirement of having at least one cat photo. <laughs> so we can go and move on from that. Um, I did what, wanted to put more cat photos in the, in the video, but it was strange. I couldn't find any other cat photos that day on the internet. I don't know, it was broke or something. So these are our training partners. These are our instructors. They're going to teach us and show us the different ways that we are being manipulated every day. Conversely, we have the bad guys. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's a pirate with a butter knife in his mouth attacking a computer. And that's pretty awesome because, I mean, we've never seen that in real life, have we, until right now. So I thought to myself, I'm going to put that in my talk, and everyone feel free to go and put that into their talks. So the bad guys, if we look at it, you have your classic con artists, your scammers, you know, the people who are trying to get money or something from you. And then you have, you know, the usual phishing and vishing attacks that we're all so familiar with, especially if you were in here most of the day. Um, and then I actually include, in, you know, also with the bad guys, watering hole attacks. Because if you think about it, a watering hole attack is taking advantage of the natural trust you have for a legitimate site, and they're injecting something bad into it, so they really are still taking advantage of basic social engineering. Um, and then finally we come back to advertising. Now, I kind of put advertising on right on the fence. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how they, we'll see how when we get into the actual talk how they can play both sides of it. Now, so we know who the good guys are, we know how, what they do, we know what we're fighting against, the bad guys, right? And like most interactions in life, we're going to take a look at like the most foundational thing that you can do in any attack or defense. We're going to start with trust. Because really and truly, let's think about it, you guys decided, you know, at DEF CON, to stay in the room with me and listen to this talk so you already have a little bit of trust in me. And as you're going to see in this example, because I've known my daughter for a long time, I have a lot of trust in her, which plays very well to her advantage. And in any attack, they're going to, someone's going to try to build rapport with you. So this is my daughter. If you look at her, half of you guys probably want to give her cookies right now because, you know, she's really cute and, you know, this is what she does. She manipulates you. And this is a question that I get asked every day. So she's building in rep repetition already with her attacks. So <laughs> kids are fascinating. They, they evolve very quickly. Um, and the question is, is simply this. And she comes up and she says, Papa, are you happy with me? And unless she's done something to make me just infuriated right before she asked this question, the answer is, you know, of course I'm happy with you because I want my daughter to grow up psychologically strong and, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, well-adjusted like, we, like any parent does. And so what you think about it is what she does when she asks this question, she's building trust with me. You know, she's, she's approaching me like I'm the target and she says, you know, are you happy with me? And I say, oh, of course. And so I respond favorably, which in her mind says, see, I've got him. <laughs> and then comes the tale. 
then I will have chocolate for dinner. Now notice she doesn't ask me a question. She tells me we're going to have chocolate for dinner. And, and I, so I want to go ahead and point out that I'm, I don't, I'm not making this up. I, when I had the idea for this talk, I started writing these things down because some of them are a little unbelievable, but it, that's what I love about them. She just, she sees it and she's like, you know what, I'm, I want chocolate for dinner. I know how to get it. Um, so how can we defend ourselves against, I mean, granted, this is a very simple example. We're going to start with our foundation. We're going to build from there. How do we defend against this? Well, as most of us in the room know, you have to start by being cautious. Now, being cautious is just good advice in general. Uh, you're at DEF CON. Be cautious. I mean, I think we can all agree. But what actually is happening behind the scenes is that when we're cautious, we slow down. We, we start to think about the situation we're in, and then we can analyze it a lot better. So whereas trust is the foundation, or is the foundation of our attacks, being cautious is kind of the foundation of all of our defenses. We start from being cautious, and then we move forward. The second part, which is a phrase that I am sure everyone in the room has heard a thousand times, and now it just kind of is background noise, but I want you guys to you know, stop for a moment and bring it back to the foreground. Trust but verify. Once again, as a software engineer, <laughs> someone may tell me, the code does this. Okay, cool. Uh, I believe them. They're usually a good programmer, and I hope that when I say that, they believe me. Because hopefully I'm a good programmer too. Uh, no one's told me that I'm not, so I'm going to go ahead and assume that. Uh, but I always go back and verify. I want to make sure that it's doing exactly what they say it's doing. I want to make sure the unit tests pass, all the usual things that we do. But the same thing applies in this situation. And usually with my daughter, it means that I have to go to an independent source. So I trust my daughter, but then I have to verify if I'm unsure about something, which, you know, as she gets older, I'm unsure about more and more things. So I go to the independent source in the family, which is my wife, because she's really the one who knows what all is happening in the family and what things should happen and shouldn't happen. So I'll go to her and I'll say, honey, do I need to do this? And she'll say, no. And really, did you have to ask? <laughs> and then I go, right. And then I walk off and I tell my daughter, no. Um, and then I say, your mother said so. And <laughs> they, see, you're always being manipulated, right? Um, so now let's look at a real world example. Because I mean, I could tell you guys stories about my daughter and that may help. But let's look at how this applies in the real world with these defenses. So I'm sure we're all familiar with Dan. He's from IT. He's here to help. Um, I mean, look at him. He's very trustworthy, and he's got the silver shades, you know. He's at his little desk. So I, I work at a very big company now. Um, it didn't used to be a big company we were acquired, and now I don't know who anyone is, especially in IT. And with a lot of the real-world examples, what you'll see is that it's actually a combination of attacks, and this, you know, this makes sense. We're starting with foundations with a three-and-a-half-year-old. We're trying to attack against, you know, we're trying to defend against people who are professionally trained, who are well-motivated. So IT being used as this approach you have trust maybe in IT, but they also have a position of authority, which helps build the trust a little bit faster because you're supposed to do what IT tells you. Um, at least that's what they keep telling me at my company. I try to find ways around that um, because I'm a software engineer and then nine years before that was a sysadmin. So I, I, I you know, appreciate those guys, but sometimes they really don't know what cool and awesome is until I show them. So. Um, Let's go, through the, let's go through the same attack. So the, they're going to, you know, calls, I'm Dan, I'm from IT, building trust, right? And the target, if they're in a good mood, they'll probably respond favorably. You know, morning, Dan, you know, I, you know, I know you're here to help me. I know you're trying to make sure my computer's up to date so we don't have any attacks. But, you know, I know my computer's up to date. I'm really on top of this stuff. Then comes the reinforcement. Dan's going to say, excellent. You know, that's great. I'm glad that you've done that. But I just need you to verify through this website. We'll call the website X not to get anybody in trouble. And, you know, so how do we apply our defenses in this situation? Well, if we're being cautious, you know, we're going to stop for a moment, we're going to think about this, and we're going to go, well, I've never had to update, I've never had to verify updates before. That seems a bit weird. And then you're going to verify through an independent source. So you trust but verify. And you say, you know, the easiest way, non confrontationally, as we kind of all know, is say, hey, Dan, I'm really busy right now, but I'll call you back in five minutes, and you don't, even if the Dan gives you a number, you ignore it, and then you call your actual IT number which you can find, and then you get it taken care of if it actually is legitimate. It's pretty straightforward, but in the heat of the moment, because Dan's going to you know, use an attack later on, it's hard to interrupt these thought patterns that we've built, because once again, trust is how we built civilization. We want to trust people. It's, you know, it's the nice thing to do. I was raised in South Georgia. We're supposedly very friendly and um, very trusting. So, um, from trust, we move on to a different type of attack. And I was actually really surprised, and this is where I started encouraging my daughter and teaching her what she was actually doing uh, in an effort to evolve her you know, very quickly. 
So developing reciprocity. Now we all know reciprocity is the you know, balance. We want to get back to this place of balance. So someone's going to give you something and then you're going to feel naturally inclined to restore the balance with them. Once again, someone gives you a gift, you feel like you should give them back a gift. This is not necessarily a bad thing. There are benign examples all over the place. So let's look at how my daughter <laughs> uses reciprocity to her advantage. So no joke, she found this vacuum cleaner. We still have no idea where. And she started cleaning things. Um, and then she turns and she says, Papa, look how good I'm cleaning. So that's the opening, right? She's, she's setting me up for something. And, um, and then, you know, she's giving me something unexpected. She's cleaning. And, you know, I don't want her to think cleaning is bad because if you saw my living room, well, probably right now, there's toys over it that I will step on and hurt my feet and my ankles and everything else. But I want her to think, you know, you need to clean up your toys. That's a good thing to do. So I don't want to shoot her down. So we want to, re you know, I, and then she'll reinforce this, right? Because now that I've kind of been like, oh, that's a good thing that you did. She'll say, look at how clean I made it. She's reinforcing that she's done something good. I did good right now, so she's never, she hasn't given me an out. She's forcing me to say yes, because she knows that I want her to be well adjusted. Um, <laughs> seriously, three and a half years old, she already knows this. Um, and then comes the ask. Since I did a good job, can I have candy? Now my daughter is not very patient, so this happens in about the span of 30 seconds. Um, she's very good at creating urgency, uh, even in her request. So. Reciprocity is a little more difficult because we are inclined, like I said, almost on an instinctive level to restore balance between, you know, we don't want to feel indebted to someone. So we can start with a very simple question to, to build our defense against this. You know, do I, how well do I know this person? Well, in the case of my daughter, I've known her since the moment she was born. And um, that is both an advantage for her and a disadvantage for her because I do know her very well. So I want to trust her. She's got the rapport. But at the same time, I know her motivations. They seem to circle around candy, chocolate. You guys see a theme forming here, right? Kids, kids like sweets. Um, so the disadvantage is now starting to pay off and she's moved on to a different type of attack and added complexity. But for right now, we can ask this question about somebody else. If we don't know them, then we can obviously start from the point of why should I trust what they're giving me and you can be a little more cautious. From there, you can start to analyze is this situation more of a give than a take? because that can usually mean that they're trying to set you up for something. Once again, you can make a really wild you know, assumption and um, be completely wrong about it, but in, the mo in most cases this is going to protect us. So we, wanna be, you know, we still want to be fair, we still want to be balanced, but we want to do it in a way that doesn't compromise us. We don't want to be the person that you know, jeopardizes our company. So now let's look at a uh, real world example. Not, maybe not quite malicious, but you know, as a home brewer um, that was mentioned before, um, this is a situation that I have to be particularly careful of. And the reason why is because if you guys don't know, this is Billy Mays. You may have known him from selling OxyClean. Um, I, I liked him because the man always had a ton of energy and I thought his head might actually explode on screen <laughs> during the commercials. Uh, so, you know, and we're very familiar with this phrase. We've heard it in many different situations, but wait, there's more. So as a home brewer, I'm up very late at night. I'm working on something and the commercial comes on in the background. This has gone down quite a bit since I switched over to Netflix. They apparently don't have commercials. Um, so you're going to give the target something unexpected. So in my case, it's going to be, they're going to start off with a pound of OxyClean. So for those of you who don't know, home brewers, we use OxyClean to clean carboys to make better beer. Uh, it's just a really good thing to do and, you know, sanitation, very good with beer. Now, a pound of OxyClean, eh, all right, I may need that, but it's not that good of a deal. And then as I'm just about to change the channel, they're like, but wait, there's more. Hmm, okay, I think I'll wait around for this. I'll see what happens. Um, we all know what's going to happen. They're going to like triple the offer. They're going to do all this stuff because we're very familiar with infomercials. But then they start to reinforce the usual thing. You won't find a deal this good. Oh, well, you know, it is three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I am a home brewer. I need some OxyClean. So he could be right. I may not find a deal this good. And then comes the ask. Can you really afford to pass up an offer this good? Well, you know, I am low on OxyClean. I could use three pounds, and they're really just asking for extra shipping. So I'm not going to lie, there has been some times where I've bought OxyClean in bulk like this. So um, we should admit our weaknesses so that we can move on, although given from the last talk, maybe not at DEF CON. Um, so please don't try to, you know, fish me with OxyClean. <laughs> and you know, the same thing is happening here. They're creating this imbalance to where you feel like compelled to act. Now, and then the last thing that they're actually taking advantage of is 
the thing that is really the linchpin to all good social engineering attacks. Because once again, if you prevent someone from being cautious, you prevent them from thinking about it, you create a sense of urgency. And urgency is where we really fall down because as humans, when we're under pressure, when we're in an urgent situation, we tend to stop thinking and we become reactionary. And you guys might be thinking, okay, so far I believe you. Your daughter, you know, she builds trust. She asks really good questions. You know, she's kind of cute so that she can get away with it, uh, like most small children are. And, and then she's kind of figured out this reciprocity probably because she's been given things at school and she learns this stuff from other kids. Very cool. How does a small child create urgency that causes a parent to react? Well, since she was an infant, she's actually had a very good way to do this. Once again, I want to point out these are real stories. Um, I do not know what she said, so I just put as close as I could get that you guys would understand. Now, the funny thing about infants and even up to toddlers is when they cry, it is at a frequency that your brain, it goes to a part of your brain and your brain reacts. Every person who's a parent in the room will know this. You've heard an infant cry. You could be like, you know, in the middle of pouring pasta into a colander and you will drop everything and run into wherever the kid is to see what's wrong. It is biological. So this is, the, this is the tool that she has. She has a biological instinct that she can use. Um, she's getting to the point where it's a little played out now. So we're, you know, getting to where it's just background noise. The story here is, and for those of you in the room who don't have parents and have not watched Frozen 9,000 times as I have, <laughs> is that my daughter used to have long hair and she wanted it always in an Elsa braid. Elsa, for those who still don't know about Frozen, is the main character. She has a braid that goes down the side of her head. Um, so after she got her hair cut because she didn't like getting her hair combed, and as you can see in the picture, it's short, she asked the stylist to put her hair into an Elsa braid. When she was told she couldn't do that, that happened. <laughs> Kids cry for reasons. Sometimes we can explain them. Sometimes we just go with it. So she said, Papa, and immediately wherever I was on my phone doing something, probably, you know, looking at videos of cats on the internet, I drop my phone, I run over to her, and I'm like, okay, what's wrong? So she's already got my attention, she's created the urgency, and then she immediately starts trying to console me. It's okay, Papa. That's weird. Um, <laughs> she was crying, and now I'm the one being told it's okay. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, you know, cool. And then she reinforces and she gives me the very urgent thing, because the thing is, is once you've gotten a child to stop crying, you do not want the child in the public place to start crying again, right? <laughs> Parents, once again, you'll get this. So she reinforces this and that gets her request in. Can you get it for me? I don't know what it is, so I just start handing her things because once again, we're in the middle of this very public place, I don't want her to start crying again. And that's kind of how she won. And I fully admit my daughter won that day. She wins a lot when she uses crying. Once again, it's kind of starting to play out and she's starting to evolve her tax even more, which I find fascinating and I am encouraging all that my wife keeps telling me to stop. <laughs> I, I plan to bring her very soon and see how she does in the real world. So, lesson one for the defense, follow the process, right? We, we hear this, we do this every day, we tell people around us to do this every day. So in this case, do you have a process? Okay, you don't, cool, that's great, we can start there. Develop a process. Now train in the process. Get to where you have dreams about the process, and then you can always follow the process, right? It's very simple, very straightforward. That's what we think, right? So let's go to lesson number two. Remember lesson number one? always follow the process. And the reason why is because if you do one thing where you're not following the process, that's really all it takes. We all know this. That's the reason why we love social engineering. It's because if you get that one person to make that one mistake, you win. Same thing with, you know, malware or anything else. You get the person to click on one button or to do one thing they're not supposed to do, you win. Um, it's kind of unfair in that way. But that's the world we live in. So let me take you to my favorite example so far. So most people in the room laugh because we're all, we're all aware of the, what this is. Uh, honestly, I could, do with, I could do an entire talk just on how awesome this slide is, just in the pop-up nature and the way that they've got it like, color-coded and the way they've got the font set. But we're talking about something different here. And so what I want to do is take a moment. We're all, we're all pretty familiar with this. But think about the person in your company or people in your company that make up the majority of the company. The people who are very afraid that they're going to be the person that does the one thing that compromises the company, right? So when they see this, a sense of urgency is created because they were doing something. Now, we won't get into whether it was bad or good. No judgment here. This is a judgment-free zone. They could have been doing something bad. They probably were doing something bad. <laughs> so this pops up, and instantly they think, oh, my God, I have compromised the company. 
Good news, the reinforcement comes from the pop-up as it is. And I want to point out that notice that the virus is in all caps and it's underlined. The other things that are dangerous are all in all caps and they're blue and they're underlined. But the majority of the page is red. And why? Because since the age of, well, one, when my daughter could start talking, she knew red light meant stop. Um, so once again, built in. That's designed as a societal pressure. We're ingrained and trained to see certain things and react to them that way. But these people are here to help. They've detected the issue and can fix it. And that's what this person thinks. They can fix it. And so then they reinforce it with the immediate action. Just call this number and we'll take care of it or click on this link and we'll take care of it. Oh man, thank goodness. I could have been the one that compromised the company, but I got these people to take care of it. So we're getting better at this, but the way that this is laid out is just, in my mind, genius because they're directing you immediately to what you want to see. They've highlighted it all in helpful yellow and it's there. So I want to also point out what I thought was hilarious about this and one of the reasons why I chose this one is because it says your computer may have a virus. But I read it three times when I was looking for it and missed the may and I knew, I mean, and I was reading this knowing what it was. So it's very effective. Once again, they use, you know, attackers will use psychology. They are well trained. This is good. So up to this point I've told you guys a couple of, a couple of stories, right? I've given you kind of three different directions that the, my, my program is kind of built on, starting with very foundational stuff. You know, started with trust, looked at reciprocity, started to see how these things are happening around me all the time in the world after, you know, kind of doing this game with my daughter. And, but at the same time, you know, we're talking about a defensive training program that all of us can use to make ourselves more aware of when we're being manipulated. So why can't we just do what I'm doing right now, right? I'm standing up here, I'm talking to everybody in the room, you guys are all paying attention. You're learning stuff. This is how we train everyone at our companies, right? And they're getting better, right? No. <laughs> well, actually, I will say there's one example. Phishing attacks seem to be having a little bit of a you know, glacier movement towards better. And I'll give them that. It seems to be working, um, depending on how it's done. But with the more general attacks, we're not really making much of a dent. And it's because it comes down to a very simple principle, right? We're not training them like, we're ha like they were going to have to fight in the real world. So, one, you know, I mentioned that I take martial arts. And one of the things that I am very comfortable with in martial arts is training like I fight. Everything that I do is for when I would actually have to use it. And I'm not a Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy, but I do know a little bit of the terminology. So what's happening in this picture is the guy on the bottom who looks like he's at a disadvantage is actually in the guard position. And what I want you guys to pay attention to is not so much the Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but look at the guy's face. He's calm. He's very relaxed because he's been here a hundred times, a thousand times. He's ready. He's waiting on the guy who looks like he has the advantage to make a mistake and then he's going to capitalize on that mistake. And the reason why he's very effective and why he's very calm is because he's trained like he's fighting. So that's what we want to do here. We want to take and create a, ser a series of low risk environments. So let's, let's look at my daughter for example. When I started playing this game with her, if she beat me, if she actually tricked me, she gets a piece of candy. Now she does have to eat her dinner first before I give her chocolate, but she still gets chocolate. And her style of the, her attack mimics the actual attacks that we look at in the world. Now granted they're, they're more simple, but that's good because I'm trying to increase my detection. I don't want to just jump into a challenge with like the guys who are competing here because I would lose every time. Um, it's just the way that it is. They're going to be much more subtle. They're going to be much more, you know, graceful in their attacks for lack of a better word. My daughter is much more like a bull in a china shop at this moment and that's good for me because I'm not the smartest person in the room and I'm always sleep deprived so she already has two advantages. <laughs> and what you're trying to do by doing this is cultivating your awareness once again in a low risk environment so if you lose you don't really lose big. So the good news is you will get better. If you have access to a small children and permission from a parent if you are not the parent, <laughs> children evolve very fast. Um, my daughter keeps me on my toes and it's amazing. I, I love it because once again, huh, I'm now trying to teach her what she's doing and the, the strategies that she's using. Uh, once again, I get told by my wife not to do this um, because my wife's falling behind in this training. But, so. That's the first thing. We want to train people and we want to train ourselves like we fight. We want to mimic the real world examples. Second thing is reward your training partners. Now I know I've made some fun about, you know, saying no to my daughter a lot. Um, this was actually a day where, and I, this is actually a good example because 
when you're, when you're playing against a child, how do you judge that they've won? And here's how I do it, and you guys can take this if it works, and you can use it in other situations. So if she asked me something, and I move to do it before I think about what I just did, she won. Because really, in a real-world example, that's all it's going to take, is me not thinking before I make an action. Um, she actually got me to do something in a mall, um, not the Elsa dress. Um, she, she got, I can't remember exactly what it was, but as soon as I realized what she was done, I'd actually taken a step and then realized, and I turned around and I was like, very good. And then she said, can I have a cookie? And I said, yes, you can. Um, so eating her cookie, very happy about life. Um, so I will say there is one, once again, an, uh, an exception to this. Oh, and I should point out, you know, we had three sets of good guys. We have children and other people around us because really, since we're all being manipulated all the time, adults count too, right? We're all manipulating people at some level. It's usually benign, um, depending on the person. But for pets, we want to, um, you know, we can get away pretty easily with them. We just pet them. They're pretty happy with that. We feed them, keep loving them. Cats, they may love you back. You know, dogs, they're awesome. They'll do anything. Um, so that's basically how we take care of that. The exception is marketing and advertising people. These guys get paid. They're already getting enough encouragement. Do not encourage them. <laughs> they don't need any extra encouragement. Um, trust me. And so taking once again advertising who I put kind of on the fence, you know, they, they're motivated most times by good, but sometimes they go off the deep end. We got to remember what we're actually training for. Because while this is all fun and games, and, and I like, you know, and I like games, we have to remember what we're, what we're actually training for. And it's not the guy in the full tactical hoodie with the laptop and the computer with three monitors. It's, it's the people who look like the rest of us. It's, the, you know, the guys who are going to be very subtle. It's the advertisers who are well-funded. Um, and so with that in mind, remember, we're in Vegas right now. You are in the midst of one of the most well-oiled machines to get you to do things. You're being manipulated 24 hours a day because I actually have had really weird dreams while I've been here, so I'm pretty sure there's something happening there. Um, maybe not for the rest of you, but maybe for me. And, um, you know, when you're walking around, everything from the tones that the slot machines make to the flashing lights, everything is designed to get you to do something that you may not want to do. You're also at DEF CON. I mean, we're, we're in the perfect training ground right now, and I hate to, hate to tell you guys, I have a bit of a head start because I've been playing this game with my daughter for like six months, so well ahead. Um, so just remember, the attackers are going to apply constant pressure. They are going to create urgency. They are going to have answers for all of the things that you're going to try to do. They are well-funded, they are well-researched, and they're going to be much more subtle than my daughter who is the bull in the china shop. So with that, are there any questions? Thank you. I saw a couple of hands. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I, and I've, I, that's what's funny is I've heard that every time I'm running into when I when I've told somebody this this theory, and they have they have a child, they're like, man, wait until they're teenagers. Yeah, and then I mean, I, so I do have to say that I, I found out, and it's actually fun for me that we have a second coming on the way in February, and so now I'm going to have to play you know double duty and two, so it's going to be a lot more fun. We got to wait another three years, but then I'll have one that's like seven and one that's six. Yes, sir. I actually have a question and a comment. So I, I, I'm in the same boat as you, but at what point did you decide that when your daughter was screaming in pain and crying that you should snap a picture for a talk? Uh, so funny story. While I was dealing with the situation, my wife thought it would be funny to snap the picture. Um, so I just took advantage of it. Um, that was her first haircut. We went there, and, um, and you know, one of us would be taking pictures of the event. The other one would be talking to our daughter. So no, I laud you because I do the same thing all the time. So yeah. thank you for the, making me feel normal. Yeah, oh yeah. And, and, I, and I have, you know, there have been times where she has done something and she's been, you know, started to tear up and I'm like, snap. One day when you're dating, I shall bring this out. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and, and that's the thing is remember that, you know, it's a game. Have fun with it. Play around with it. And, uh, you know, go out and have fun. Cool. As I was going to say, there's no more questions. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to stand up here and speak. Over there. Oh, sweet. Yes, sir. Sorry, less of a warning. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when the second one comes, the second one learned from the first one. Oh, yeah. The first one learns from the second one, and the rate of growth is exponential. Yeah. <laughs> and then you be cautious. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's why I'm very happy about that. Yes, sir. But you also learned from your first one, you let the baby cry five more minutes. Yeah, yeah, hopefully, like I said, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very much more aware, I think, of the biological thing that I want the noise to stop. My wife, 
you know, she, she's, a, she's a very good mom, so I'm not, not trying to make fun of her, but she, she's much better at the, you know what, I'm going to let them cry for about another minute and see how that works out. And I'm, I'm the one over there going, okay, has it been a minute? You know, it's, and she's like, it's been five seconds. You need to, like, just put on headphones or something because you're, you're, you're crazy. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.